food while you're there. Second and six. Flewellen again gets shoved backward. Nice play. Lewis Trinka Passat on the play. Well, John, it's good to be back for football, I'll tell you that. Preseason, you get to the end of these games, they are what they are. You know that. But you know what? You get a chance to produce. Coulter under pressure. Coulter on a keeper. Coulter wrapped up and brought down by Trigger Passat. And the Hawkeyes win it in overtime here in Iowa City. What a game. What a finish here at Kinnick Stadium. And rugged. It's, uh, speaking of rugged, Louis Trinka Passat in the house. What's going on, guys? Boy, we're jealous of you, boy, I tell you. Damn straight. You know, man, you, you, you did the dream. Every lame tech player's dream. You and Lake and Roy, you really did it, boy. We were following you all the way. I was running the lame tech football site. I think you've seen all the stuff I was putting up there. All yeah, your game yeah. tape and your articles and all this other stuff, man. <laughs> so it's finally, it's us, finally good to meet the man behind all that work. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you know, it was, it was it was a hobby, you know. And you know, uh, Pete, Pete and I grew up in the neighborhood just like you did, and uh, I I snapped because the St. Louis Cardinals before they became the Phoenix Cardinals used to have their training camp at Eastern Illinois where I went to school, and I was a long snapper as well, and I snapped for them, and then they had me run to forty, and they said, "Kid." Uh, you're going to get your degree? I go, yeah. I go, well, why don't you get your degree? Back in the day when they had like Neil Lomax and Otis Anderson, all guys you probably never heard of. And then I got, then I had a tryout with the Chicago Bruisers. And that was the first arena team in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the whole football deal there. And uh, Sean Payton played for him for a little bit, the guy who's the coach of the Broncos now. And, um, yeah, that was my, my, my claim. But you guys lived the dream. You know, it's uh, – it was crazy. You know, Dennis Dennis Brady and I were watching you when you play with the Rams and you were playing, you were starting all those preseason games. We're going, ah, that we didn't dawn on us. Aaron Donald was ahead of you. You know what I mean? But, you know, what can you do? But you made it all so far, man. You made it You made it from Lane. You know, your parents were Romanian. I, I put that picture of your dad at the, uh, at the uh, Soldier Field the one time. You remember you seeing that? Yeah. That was rooting you on. I think you guys were playing Fenwick. I'm not sure. And then uh, yeah. you guys made it to Iowa. I thought I talked to Carl Mueller. I go, man, this guy's going to play guard and go to the NFL. Because, you know, when you go to Iowa, it's either two things. D-line, offensive line, when you're a big guy like that. Am I right? You know? And the guys with the, uh, the like the 18 numbers either become a tight end or a linebacker, you know? And, um, no, we watched you, man. We uh, we we were there all the time with you. You had you had real good lateral movement on, on your pursuits. I noticed that. You know, you were a good power rusher. But you also often often got what double team, but that's good because you free up another guy, right? So that's that's cool in the whole scheme of plans. So now we watch you guys, man. We uh we were really happy, real proud of you. I mean, we thought, man, that's all right. That's you you were like one of us when you made it and, and Lakin yeah. made it, you were one of us making it, you know, and uh that's something to really hang your head on. I mean, you know, your NFL career didn't pan out as much as it should have. But I think, uh, you know, you're in a new direction now. So different plan. Got... Different plan. He's going to talk to us about that. Louis yeah. Trinka Passat, thank you for coming on Chicago back in the day, my friend. Absolutely. It's, it's uh, an honor to be here. Yeah, it's an good. honor. Good. Some memories. <laughs> <laughs> Lane Tech grad, Iowa, number 90 in the house. And currently, what do we say? I... First of all, do you actually live in a house or you uh do you put up a tent as you're taking that cross around the country? of Jesus is just fully committed to, to following God at all costs. He's interning with me right now, but I would say sometimes I'm learning from him uh, because of his passion to, to share the gospel with people, to share the message of Christ. And so he's more than just an intern. Um, he's someone I am encouraged with and, and 
learning from as well. And he's an encouragement to, to me and many others. What's happening? What, why do you feel so emotional? I don't know, I just am. I think, uh, I think it's just amazing how the Lord brings everything full circle in a sense to show one old life and old past and that living for Him, there's nothing better. I was in that stadium and 70,000 people were cheering for me and whatever, sometimes chanting my name, but it's not about that. And just talking to this one guy right here and even walking with this lady, I just, there's nothing that's more fulfilling. Uh, that's where we park. Well, thank you. Yeah. Have a nice day. Yeah. So I have a question real quick. We'll walk again. Yeah. Um, so what does what does the message of the cross mean to you? God, I don't want to cry. <laughs> but um, I kind of strayed away from the church because um, there was bad experience with my pastor was questionable. Yeah. Ever since then, I just haven't been willing to kind of open up about that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard that men would, that, you know, they're representing God. And yeah, and then to see him do something like that, it kind of just destroyed my trust in the church and everything. Yeah, that's, that's just really hard. There's a lot of pain there. Yeah. And, um, yeah, your name's Heidi, right? Yeah. All right, can I put my hand on your shoulder? Yeah. All right. Jesus, I just pray for Heidi, and I just pray that you comfort her, and we thank you for this encounter with her. And, Holy Spirit, we just pray for, for healing in her heart. And uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you say during all that time, at some point, there was was there ever a time where you like gave Jesus your life, you surrendered? I don't think I've had an experience like that yet. Yeah. And I think I'm waiting for it. What if today's the day? I guess it is. I'm crying, so... Yeah. You know, I... Do us again. Yeah, that's weird. No, that's literally so weird. I, I was taking a video and I was like, oh my God, I see them again. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence. No, like, it's really weird. Like, this is so weird. And I haven't cried in so long. It's crazy. You guys are making me rethink my life right now. The beautiful thing is, it's not about getting it all right today. It's just Jesus, yeah. all he's doing is he's opening the door and he's inviting you into his home, into heaven. And when you enter a relationship with someone, you figure it out as you get to know them more and more. And all just taking a step of that, it's that first leap of faith, that first step of faith, saying, you know what, I'm done living for myself. Jesus, I'll do, I'll, I, want, I want to live for you. I give you control of my life. And it's freeing. The, the, the Bible says where, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Meaning, He's going to free you from your bondages and you get to walk in peace. You get to just enjoy their lives. He wants you to enjoy the things, but it's doing you with Him and the, he's the source and we're missing the source at times and uh he wants to be your source he wants to be your source today he's, he's pursuing you and you feel what you feel right now because the holy spirit is touching your heart yeah it's creepy it's freaking creepy well, it's, it's the lord he's, well he's, like he's, what do i do now it's like, just it's the bible says you confess with your mouth jesus is lord you say jesus i give you my life and i believe if you do that from your heart he'll he'll meet you here and it's and that's what you want. Just say that right now. Jesus. Jesus is I, life. I give you my life. I give you my life. And just trust him. <laughs>not living for me it's living for Jesus and it's just I don't really know how to put it into words it's just it's he wants to use me and he's showing me how he's using me and he's just, yeah, I'm just emotional <laughs> Holy Spirit, we just pray that you fill Heidi right now with your spirit. I pray today that she sees this as a new beginning. The Bible says if you put your faith in Jesus, and you believe, if you believe it in your heart, it says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. In other words, for me it was football. That was my life. That was my identity. But when I lost that, I was depressed. I didn't know what to do. And I encountered the love of Jesus. And when I encountered that love, he said, Louis, I don't care about what you did. He said, I love you. Jesus doesn't require you to do anything other than just give him your heart and faith. Guarantees. Here you are now, a veteran, a leader, 
Um, the unit is, appears from my level to be pretty strong. What's that been like just to see that turnaround in your career? I mean, there's no words really to explain it. It's just kind of like a roller coaster ride. I mean, everybody has their ups and downs. Where are you at right now, Lewis, in Dallas? <laughs> Yeah, I'm in Grapevine. Uh, I'm temporarily just staying at a friend's house right now. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. No, you got a great story, man. You got a great story. So you're a Chicago guy. You talk uh, good like us. Uh, how the did you start out? Getting... <laughs> yeah. You got into you football, know. what, your freshman year at Lane? Is that what happened? Like, where'd you grow up, man? Yeah, I grew up in the Lakeview area in Chicago. And, yeah, I went to... It was a Walt Disney Magnet School there on Lakeshore Drive, right off uh, Montrose. Oh, that's uh, a good school. Yeah, and uh, you, pretty you much. Got, did you have to take a test to get in lane? Uh, I did, yeah. and I didn't get who, in. Who'd you, who'd you cheat <laughs> off? <of? laughs> I I didn't do. I, I, if I remember correctly, I didn't do well in my reading portion, and uh, I was more of a math science guy, and. Uh, uh, my brother and sister went to Lane Pryor, and they were in band. And uh, was it Mr. O'Brien, I think, was the band director yeah. at the time. And he knew Coach Rio really well, the head football coach there at the time. And Oh, that was your ticket there, boy. Yeah, he said, hey, this guy wants to come here and play football. And I got another letter in the mail a couple weeks la later saying I got in. <laughs> <laughs> well, how they know it's you amazing played how that works, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, how did he? How they know you played football, man? Because I, you started off as a wide receiver, linebacker. You weren't on the line. Like, what were you playing when you first started? Did Did you even know where to put in the pads? Uh yeah, I learned all that. Yeah, that during the during that camp day at Lane. Uh the only football I was exposed to was flag. And we had a little bit at uh elementary school. They just had started it my last two years there, seventh and eighth grade. And well, what was they, your first position? What'd they put you at? Uh outside linebacker slash D end. That's what okay. they threw. Okay, so you were all right. So this this wide receiver, you were never a wide receiver, were you? Um, I wanted to play tight end. That's what that's that's what okay. I wanted to do. I always wanted to catch the ball. Um, and I told them, but they were like, "No, you're playing the end." So I was like, "Okay." So I just did whatever they told me to do. You know, I was just happy to put on some pads and hit somebody, and it was exciting. So I had that I, I had that dream too, except the coaches told me you're either going to push the guy away from the ball or go get the ball. That's you're not going to be handled. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just big, and they said you should play uh, football. Uh, Brunswick was our guy, and he he was a legend back in the day. And Rio was a legend in your day, right? Right, Butch. Like, what do we know about Rio? Um, well, he came he came in after he he was with his brother on a staff in the seventies. I think it was seventy. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm, I'm thinking seventy seven, seventy eight, and then his brother and him, uh, both Rich and Ron, left for California. Uh, Ron was a longtime assistant at different schools, suburban Deerfield. I mean, he was at Austin. Uh, they had another brother named Rob, uh, Bob. Uh, and then Rich was a, um, he was at Har Harrison High School, and he was at a couple other West Side schools. And then in the 80s, he was still in California. By the 90s, he came to uh, back to Lane, and um, he first started off as an assistant coach and athletic director under Carwell. And then once um, they had a coaching change where Ron came back and coached, I think that was, uh, I want to say 80, I'm sorry, 96, 97, Ron's first year. You know, they, they had a four years where they struggled, and but they were playing tougher teams on their car off. You know, they, were, yeah. they weren't, you know, I mean, it wasn't no, uh, wasn't no, uh, what today, uh, a Steinmetz or a, uh, uh, some of Lakeview, one of these right, teams, right, right. you know, where you blow out 50 to nothing. They were playing some serious teams under Karloff. But anyways, Ron came back in. They brought the 77 guys in, which uh, Louis, Louis knows. It's, uh, you know, Coach Munoz from Mayfield and Coach um, Coach Art from Metal. Um, as a matter of fact, Coach Mayfield, every time on the football site that they talked about Lakin, he always threw you in right there, too. Because you guys, as far as they're concerned, are inseparable. You guys made those teams go along with your teammates, but he didn't want to see one guy get more glory than the other guy because you thought you're equally hard workers and you you both attain uh, attain a lot. I mean, uh, like I was talking about earlier. I mean, I played 
I didn't play high school, uh, great, uh, high, any, any football growing up myself. It was all tackle football on the street, flag football, all the meathead sports. You know, when we were out when we were kids, parents didn't want us in the house. Get your hell, head, hell out of the house. Go come in the alley. In, come back in when the uh, – play in the alley or in the, or in the gangway. And uh, when the lights go down on the outside, you come back in the house. We don't want to see you in that. Maybe dinner. But uh, when, it, when the seasons change, we play different sports, and football was one of them. And uh, when I got to Lane, I had the problem with those uh, thigh pads. I was putting them wrong. I had the knee pads where the thighs were and all that kind of nonsense. So you're worn along. You're worn alone on that one, you know. And uh, so anyways, getting back to the Rios, Rio, Rich came, and he did a great job. I mean, he, he got voted into the uh, – Illinois High School Football Hall of Fame. He's the third Lane Tank head coach to do it. Sam Brunswick is one, and El Manason's the other one. Um, and it's and they just did a good job. They they are no nonsense coaches. You know they they didn't want a lot of window dressing. You know, like a lot of teams would have 50, 60 guys on the sideline. They wanted their forty who could play and contribute on special teams. You know, two way players like yourself and Lincoln. You know, because I think what did you play tight end a little bit? And you played tackle, right, at Lane? I mean, uh, your yeah. junior and senior. Because I remember mm-hmm. seeing, I remember seeing you catch a uh, touchdown pass against Fenwick at Soldier Field, right? And because uh, that was on, a, yeah, that was, a, yeah. We, hey, the best I could do is I recovered a fumble in the end zone when I was at Triton College when they had a team. But uh, no, we uh, we watched you guys, man. And uh, so the the real the real and the seventy seven guys took over, and it extended into the time you played. And then Rich retired, I think, in 2000, uh, after you guys, a year after you guys, I think your senior year, after your senior year, Rich retired, right? Yeah, and yeah. then uh, they had another coach in there, and well, nah, it's kind of yeah. been uh, kind of been iffy at best over there. So, but, so uh, Lewis, we, we got you, okay, Lakeview, we got to your freshman year so far. Were you on the freshman team, or do they just, they put you straight up to uh, freshman, or the sophomore team? Is that how they had it? When I was I there, was freshman, I, sophomore, yeah, right, and then uh, varsity. Where they where they stick you in, Lewis? Yeah, I got. I was on the the sophomore team. Um, yeah, coach was it Coach Ron? That was his name. I forget. It's been a while. Um, I was there with him, and then uh, we had won the city championship, and then they 2008, were two thousand eight. That was uh, what the sophomore team. That was in oh. Uh, six or seven? Had to be old. Se- so- did you play on a freshman, or did they call you right up to sophomore right away? I went, yeah, I went straight to the sophomore team, and then, okay. uh, the end of that year, they they briefly brought me up to the varsity. They tested me out at a couple practices, but then they were just like, "We'll just uh, we'll finish the season, and then we'll you know we'll move you up next season. We'll play, we'll, you know, we'll we'll work with you." So then my sophomore year, I got moved up to varsity. How was the gravel back there? Do they have gravel or grass? <laughs> oh, yeah, that was that was the best. You know, they put the letters <laughs> right on the gravel and the dirt, and uh, everybody, you know, you got I don't know fifty guys going through the ladder, and the dust is just dust. flying everywhere, and you're breathing it in, and you have the sewer smell right off of the yeah the yeah the river street, yeah. street there. So yeah. it was it's what we had, and the old rusted. Uh, Tackling dummy uh, pads, yeah. the metal big bruisers. Yeah, get your tetanus uh, shot. So, <laughs> all right. So, so you're going through that. Uh, your boy Lakin was. When did you? When did you meet him? Um, I met him my sophomore year because I think he came in. They saw him and coach. He he went straight to varsity. So <laughs> I didn't see him till my sophomore year. Okay. Hey, he was a big guy right away, huh? Yeah, now, he, he was huge. <laughs> well, you're Romanian, and he's he's not from uh, around here either. Where's Where was he from? He's from Jamaica. Yeah. So, so you got a Romanian and a, a Jamaican going at it at, at Lane Tech. Uh, did you guys square off at one another? Did you guys say, hey, man, wow, this guy's good, and the other guy's saying this guy's good? Did you ever figure that out, or you it waited till like, junior year? Uh, I, no, yeah, we did during camp. They would always have us go head to head. Uh, what do they call it? like Oklahoma drills or whatnot? Yo. And and uh, um, I don't remember many of the battles. I just know that it was pretty like 
he was good and I was good. It was like almost kind yeah, of, yeah. And I would say. Um, well, you get I, to the Oklahoma, for the people that know Oklahoma, you get everybody standing around. You get a running back, two linemen, and it's like, you know, and a linebacker and go. Is that how it was? Yeah, we had and a then, little area and yeah, exactly. We just went at each other just straight head to head. Who can, who can put the other guy down? And it was just most of the time I remember it was stalemates. I don't remember uh ever losing but i wouldn't say i i, uh, I defeated damn him. straight lewis you never lost Luke, <laughs> we'll keep it at that <laughs> maybe he's got a different story i don't uh, know what when did you start to uh like get good i know you were always good but like junior year then the letters start coming in from the colleges uh now i don't know about your family my family didn't have money coming up butch's didn't either and we you know we had to play ball and you know get a ride were you looking for a ride or you know what? Because you're starting to think about colleges, I would assume. Like, did you have a plan for getting to college? Was football part of that plan? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to play in the NFL. That was that was my goal and dream since I could remember. Um, <laughs> so for uh, sure, you're going to get it right, is what you're saying. Well, my mom was like, "You're not, you're not leaving. You're staying here. You're not going to college <laughs> to play. You're not doing that to play football." So. Uh, eventually I got old enough to the point where I was like, you know, I'm going like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. like she can't stop you with the pots and the pans anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think, uh, it helped with my brothers we were kind of like, he's getting a good opportunity. Like you just got to let him go. Um, and then she obviously saw I me mean, my dad never said much. He was just whatever. It's kind of like didn't do your more, thing yeah and uh but, you know i did well in school and um it was a free ride and then once they kind of got a chance to visit some schools as they were in this process of learning what this is like what it's what were mean, your five what were your five visits you take all five um no i only went to iowa <laughs> that was i remember my... seeing stanford is one of your choices and i was wondering i go you had to have good grades because Stan stanford checks the grades before they even offer people a ride huh? he's a three two guy Three two, wow. Yeah, the, uh, the, I think Pete and I could have added up to three two at one point, and uh, scraping for a two point to get my ride at Southern. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so you took one ride. So friends came out. Like when you had to get a ton, a ton of letters sent to you, Lewis. What are you talking about? You only yeah. had one letter from Kirk Ferentz and said, "Hey, come here." Well, they were the first. Okay. Um, this was after my junior year, January of twenty, like seven, um, two oh seven, two thousand ten. After we won the after we won the city championship, that that following a year, oh nine, beginning of yeah. the year, they sent me. Oh a letter. wait, hold on, I'm getting my my years messed up. Two thousand eight was the championship, or two thousand nine yeah. was two thousand eight. Okay, two thousand eight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And. uh you know, they, they, they offered, we, then I started getting a ton of letters. I had, I think I had over 25 something offers from various schools. Um, but yeah, I we went there and ultimately what, what, what mattered was it being close to home to Chicago. So my family could come. Um, and then I was, uh, I was also praying about it. I remember and one night, cause there was rumors of coach friends leaving yeah, um, and that's was that at that at that point I had went through the process. I kind of knew like this is where I was gonna go, but the only thing holding me back was this rumor of him leaving. And I remember I was praying, and literally the next day I'm watching ESPN, and on the bottom of the ESPN ticker I see Coach Ferentz gets a five year contract extension, and it was just nice. like immediate answered prayer. And I was like, I told my mom, and I knew right away, and it was also. In that time, Stanford Stanford was a top choice. I did because they actually were recruiting me to play tight end slash fullback, like the hybrid. Um, oh, wow. And, uh, it was, you know, Jim Harbaugh. And um, <laughs> they really were upset that I didn't even want to go for a visit um, because I knew in my heart that it was too far yeah, away. Why waste your time going to the other places? Me, I was kind of, you know, I – Because you're going to have a great time. I took the time. trips. That's I wanted I... to go. <laughs> 
A couple schools were smart, though. They looked at my academic records, you know, and uh, my first two and a half years at Lane was a social atmosphere. So I play, I paid for it in a purgatory at Triton for two years, but I got another scholarship. So how, what do you know? What do you know? So, Lewis, you, you said you prayed. When when did religion come in? Like, was that always a thing? Is it, you know, uh, an upbringing? Because, you know, you grow up in the city. You're part of a parish, right? Were you part of a parish in Lakeview? Like, I... How did you get involved with religion early go, going, or it didn't happen till later? Uh, yeah, my parents, they always went to church. Um, how they got connected to Chicago was they were escaping communism. A lot of people were escaping communism around the same. Some had left 10 years prior to them, and then they had left, and there was a community here or there in Chicago. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was a small Romanian Pentecostal church, and that's the church I grew up in. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a lot of times it was just, we were, didn't have a choice. We just went. And right, uh, right. that's, that's the kind of the environment I grew up in. And uh, I remember at 11 years old, I gave my life to Jesus. I said, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Um, I remember I got baptized. I knew what I was doing. And, but uh, ultimately my purpose was football still, you know, I, I, that kind of, that uh spiritual high moment so to so to speak kind of faded you know you have life and then things of the world just kind of sucked me into the world and wanting fame wanting football and ultimately uh i had a relationship with jesus i would say but it was more like secondary so when things went well it was like okay cool i'm good and then when i needed things then i kind of went like hey, i need to pray now so let me pray yeah, how did you get there, man? Because 10, 11, me and Butch, we're like, he, we were both in Catholic schools at a time because uh, the public schools, we got the crap beat out of us. So our, our, our mom yeah, said, rough like, road. yeah, we had to get into the Catholic schools. And these nuns beat the hell out of us, man. I wasn't thinking about Jesus. I was thinking about kicking his nuns butt. How did you? Yeah, <laughs> nuns come up behind you with a ruler and give you a nape right in the back of your nape. Pap. <laughs> so you're 10, 11, like the. So you got baptized and it's like all of a sudden you, I'm not trying to make light, but did a light right. come down and say, wow, I'm in at that young age. Um, I remember I was, you know, uh, I just had an encounter with the Holy spirit when I was very young. Um, and I just remember it was during our, our church would hold like prayer nights during the summer yeah. and they would be every day and they would be from seven to like midnight or whenever it ended. Um, mm. uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I just went and would pray, would pray. And, and I remember one, one day I just saw, I had this vision of, of like, kind of like a cloud and two hands coming from the cloud and me just putting my hands up, reaching out. I was God. And, um, I just was filled with the Holy spirit and, um, I just felt felt his presence. I felt his joy. I can't really explain it. It was yeah, just yeah, yeah. the moment I didn't want. I didn't even want to stop praying. I just I remember I was just praying, praying. And time would fly by, and I knew, you know, I'd always known. I'd never known life without Jesus, really. But that was the I guess I say eleven because that was the moment where I'd gotten baptized and I knew what I was doing. I was saying, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow Jesus, um, and. Uh, well, I yeah. just know, I just know running like, you know, on my ninth gas, or I'm like, Jesus, please save me from. That's when I saw Jesus come in. So, <laughs> all right, uh, getting back to uh, friends. So you had the letter. You didn't. You made one visit. Okay, you couldn't even go with Lakin somewhere and you know have a good time. That's that wasn't your thing. You're like you couldn't get a free dinner, or a free plane ride, or anything like that. Yeah, we, I mean, we went, uh, we went to Michigan cause, uh, they were heavily recruiting him. Um, yeah. they never offered me, but I went, we went, it was on the drove up there. Or? Yeah. We drove up there. Uh, I think, I think coach Rio was with us on that one. I don't remember. Um, but we, we did get to see everything and, um, uh, and I don't know if we went on any others, I think, but yeah, it was just, I just knew. And also, you know, I, I wasn't, I'm not a party guy and I and, yeah. you know, I'll get wasted. And I know pretty much that's what they did on these official visits. Yeah. And, and yes, even when that's I, what, I exactly know, what they did, precisely. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> even that was my whole, ten, that was my whole Tennessee visit. I went with some guy who was, my host was a uh, 
dating a Playboy model, and he just spent time with her. So I just ordered booze from the hotel room. So that was something there at Tennessee. Met her smart Look, school. They checked oh, my grades never, before they never, Southern Illinois, nothing like that happened there. So, so Lane Tech, did you ever go to, uh, you know, the Rocks, Foster Beach? Uh, where'd you Where'd you hang out? I know you didn't party, but you know the boys go out. Oak Street Beach, out North teammates. Avenue Beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we went to North Avenue. We went to Montrose Beach area. That all, all the beaches there. Yeah, Montrose. Okay, all right. Family was really close, so we grew up. You know, we we we. Yeah, you're right there. Yeah, and yeah, we were right there, and I, uh, yeah, and so that's that we hung out there. Um, picnics with the churches, with family, friends. We would go to. Uh, there was a park in a suburb in Skokie. I forget what it was called. Uh, but uh, we, we'd go. Oh, it was a Prozel Park. We'd go there in the summers and play volleyball. And that's which pretty- happens to, which happens to be a little tidbit. Prozel Park. Prozel Park was named after the grandfather of the coach who took over for Rich Rio, Fred Prozel. Just a little uh, FYI. All right, go ahead. interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I did. You know, we for us, we actually couldn't get out the house. Our parents were so strict. Uh, we had to beg them to let us go, like ride our bikes around the park and and all of that. Otherwise, it was school work. And okay, fair enough. Getting back to the religion, Lewis uh, Butch. You remember, I got picked up a couple times because you know we're out on the street playing, and then we would have the uh, the school buses from Indiana. I forgot. Maybe it's a Baptist church or whatever. They would pick up pick us kids up off the oh, street yeah. and take yeah, us out. I got baptized yeah. like four times. Am I, am I like, what? <laughs> well, oh, no, my mo- my mother watched out for them. My mother says, here they come, get in the house. We don't know who they are. Because at the time they were approaching kids. You didn't know who they were. I mean, uh, at, at that time there was no more door to door salesmen like there were back in the seventies. Yeah. And these guys were uh, coming up to you, clean white shirts and, they were wearing floods. You could see their white socks on them. They were coming up to you, and um, they looked almost like the guy uh, Steve, uh, Michael Douglas's uh, one character, where he freaked out the one time. Yeah, 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 they dressed yeah. like that, and they would come up to you, and they would start doing the whole loving stage and trying to encapsulate you and no, everything so like you want that. A free lunch? I go, yeah, hop on. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, my, I didn't my, see the light. I saw I saw a school bus, and I was in Indiana. I was back at four o'clock, all wet. All right, so getting back to the story, Lewis. That's fine. So, so you go to Iowa, and uh, you and my son are about the same age. So when you're at Iowa, my kid went to Iowa, and I would watch you number 90 because, uh, you know, that Lane Tech sticks out. And, Butch, I think Iowa City, that sta- um, Kinnick Stadium is like uh, the old Comiskey Park, man. They just crank out the ACDC, and it's a free for all when that game starts. Looks like it. Looks like it's a good time there. You know, I mean, I watch the games on on TV all the time. I've never been, but I mean, you see kids from the Chicago area wearing Iowa gear just to go there and party and hang out. It's such a great atmosphere. It must have been great on the field. How was it coming out to your first game when you were playing? But I want to know. And feeling the rush of the crowd because they they don't sit on their hands over there. They'll they'll stand for a long time and clap you guys. You know what I mean? Oh, oh they'll, come on, let's go! And I hear that you see that all the time. And that and that, what is it after the first quarter when they wave at the hospital? Is that what it is? I can't remember. Uh, I think it's halftime they do it. Half-time, half-time. Yeah. Okay, unbelievable to get people to do that and the reason they do it. It's really cool. Um, how was that feeling that rush when you go out in the field? Yeah, I mean, it's it's there's nothing like it, you know. You have got seventy, almost eighty thousand fans, just lunatics. Yeah, music's playing. It's you can feel the the electricity in the air, the the buzz. It's just it's just go time, you know. Adrenaline, you're you're it's sky rocketing in the body. I mean, you just you're just ready to go hit somebody at that point, you know. Um, it's loud, loud huh? You can't wow. you can't hear much. All right, let, let's let's go to the other end of it. What's it like being what? dropped off at school where there's no other kids and it's 90 degrees and you're getting uh, dropped down on the scout team? How's that? Uh this was what in high school or are you, or are you referring to college? Okay, about Iowa. 
Um, you were never on. You were never on scout team. Come on, you man. got redshirted your first year, right? Which I think is yeah. a smart move because you went and got your masters too, right? Yeah, I didn't have a choice. I I came in. I was two hundred thirty-five pounds. So, and then they were like, "You're playing D tackle." I didn't even have. Once they signed me, it was over. They told me what to do. So I just. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, was like, oh, I never played D tackle. This is going to be interesting. Um, yeah, it was brutal. I mean, you're going against the starters the guys that are like 300 plus pounds and they're super strong. And here I am, you know, you got the big fish mentality, uh, coming out of a small pond, going into a big pond. Now and you're the small fish and you get well, like, here, run this play. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And you didn't crush. You're, home, you're homesick as hell, dehydrated, beat up. And that nap during the day, there's nothing better than that nap during the day. Uh, so that's kind of where, you know, the religion, I don't, for me, it wasn't a religion. You have like an inner voice in your head that replays, you know, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. Some people have it, you know, don't have it. Or some people have it in their head saying, quit, 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 quit. Is that what kept, did you ever think about quitting? And they say, you know, you had your religion pulling you back in to refocus, to keep going. Um, I think for me, it was the, the the passion to play the game. I think it was that. And I think, um, it was definitely that. And also I'm very driven, uh, and, uh, I, I just, it wasn't in me. That's all I can really say. Like it was yeah, just yeah. Wasn't in me to quit. Um, and I knew it wasn't anything that I was doing wrong. It was just a, our defensive line coach at the time, the way the the who he was and how he was coaching and just the environment that nobody really liked him. And it was just a cancerous environment, really. And he was just sucking the air out of the the, the sucking the fun out of the game. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't fun. And uh, I remember even talking to Lakin because he was at Duke. And I was like, yeah. dude, is your coach like this? Like, is this normal how they are in college? Because like. I, I don't know. This is the only thing I know. And yeah. he he did. I mean, he said his coach was intense, but he wasn't like our D line coach. So, yeah, um, yeah. I, I pretty much was. I got to the point where I was like, I told Coach Ferentz, I'm like, I don't know. I'm not. I, I just. I don't want to play anymore. This is. You know. I was thinking about switching positions. I was just. Yeah. At that point, I just didn't want to be with this D line coach. That was the problem. Yeah. And. uh same thing. I was, I remember I told my dad and he's like, well, what are you going to do? Like, you know, yeah. you're going to work at McDonald's, this and that. He's like, I can't afford to pay for your college. Um, right. And something happened. I, again, I remember I was, this was during bowl prep in 2011 for about a week straight. I was praying, oh my God, like, I don't know how you can, but somehow get rid of this coach. It's either that or it's like, God, I, I, I don't know. I can't quit. I don't know. You brought me here. I was like, if you have, you had me here for a reason. And I remember Coach Ferentz gave me three days off. And when I come back on my third day, um, I found out the D-line coach left. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> what what year was this, Lewis? Uh, this was 2011. 2011. Okay. Now, we can, we can delete some of this. But, you know, there were some uh, softer players on the team that were putting in complaints. I'm not saying you're one of them, but. I think it was like the uh, the wide receivers. The you know what I'm talking about. They were bringing up the racial stuff and all that, trying to get friends. Might maybe this was after you, but I think it was you know at the same time. Does any of that ring a bell? Uh, I know a lot of this came out after I was gone. I okay, mean, that's what it was. Yeah, okay. more so like the past year or two. Um, yeah. As far as I when I was there, I I was never. I didn't hear anything. Uh, yeah. Well, our D line coach that that was there, he was a jerk. He definitely he said some things that would would probably he may be in jail if if yeah they get yeah out now you know too uh, old school too old too too old school yeah yeah you know, was, Coach Munoz Coach Munoz Chicago cop tough as nails used to walk what three miles to school from Humble Park every day good guy though he was in it for you guys if, especially if you've seen guys like you and Lakin trying he liked that. Coach yeah. Munoz does, and uh, he was a good coach for you guys, you know. So nothing like him, huh? Yeah. Butch, this guy was going up against how many first rounders do you go up against, man? Uh, how, how many did you? Uh, just in uh, practice, he, not in the games. Just in practice. Yeah, in practice is what I'm saying. You had what? Riley. Uh, who was the other one? Who were the Who were the studs? Steve, Brand, Brandon Sheriff. Sure, the sheriff. Um. 
Th- those are those those two those are, are enough. Are they were both first minor. rounders. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. say who's better. They're, they're, they're one of Ferenc's, uh sons play center against you in practice. Uh, Brian, yeah. is that what his name was? James. James. Ferenc. James. A whole bunch of Ferenc is around there. So, so you went against him. I think he played with the Lions, didn't he? Is that possible? I know that they've had center. I know they had after him. They had Daniels Patriots, and other man. people. He was. He went Patriots. back to uh, uh, Belichick. They're all old school guys from the old Cleveland team. Yeah, uh, yeah. He was with the Patriots. Yeah, and I think he's okay. I think maybe he's still there with the Patriots. I'm not sure. He could be. A, he could be a snapper. So, so you're going up against the first round. You didn't answer the question. Who was better? Uh, Brandon Sheriff by far. Yeah. He seemed oh, like he was a pretty course. strong drive uh, blocker, like really strong. Oh man, that guy was so strong. He was he was he was strong. He shattered. He was cleaning. Was it? I think four hundred ninety-five pounds, like five times, making him look like he, he shattered Iowa record. Jesus. And Jesus. man, yeah. Oh, there's no way to beat him head on. For me, it was speed and technique. I, if I had a chance. Um, but yeah, and then he got moved. He was at guard at the time, and then they moved him to tackle my senior. Yeah. So I didn't go against him as much anymore. A little but, praying got that move done, I bet. <laughs> I know I had, had, had to be held to go against that guy. My my big guy I had to go against was John Jakovic, and he was a two time All American at Eastern. He's a big shot on ESPN now. But that guy, sure, he no. played played for Dolphins and the Browns and the Packers and stuff. And just a nightmare. It's just the, you, you, after you're done going against them, I think you probably feel that against Brendan was that you, what am I even out here? I can't even do nothing against this guy. Why am I here? So I would say that their D line, who was your counterpart? I want to say 72 uh, African-American guy. He was pretty, uh, he yeah, was Carl, pretty good. Carl Davis, Carl Davis, whatever happened to him, man. He, he was, was a big star. Uh, he's with, I think he's with the Patriots too right now. So. No kidding. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I so actually you guys, just him uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. You, you guys held your own, man. You held your own. Okay. So now, okay, you're playing ball, and uh, you know what'd you get in, in the Big Ten, second team or something like that? What did you? Uh, I forget. I know you had. So- yeah, I know my, you're a team uh, captain. Yeah, junior. Yeah, he had to see. Old. Yeah. Um, honorable mention, and then senior year, yeah, it was second team. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll go 10. No, you were you definitely old school, you're grinding it out. Okay, so, uh, what was the last practice at Iowa like? What was the ceremony? I know senior day, you get a rose, the parents come in, but before you do that, you have a last practice. Do you have any tradition there at Iowa, like the last hits or anything like that, or it's like Pardon the pun. Uh, they got him out of here. <laughs> no, that we have a senior. They do like a senior kind of luncheon, dinner type thing, okay. and okay. honor the seniors. And uh, yeah, they do the rows. They they call us by name, and we we run in. That's the last home game. Um, Butch and I, you know, at Eastern at Southern, it was uh, <laughs> yeah. There was a no five dollar five dollar uh, uh, coupon to if you worked out on a Sunday gave you a coupon to go to uh, uh, McDonald's but another <laughs> thing you did with Pete and I are jealous of and I'll tell Pete I know Pete is because I am yes. you played in the prep bowl you had a nice jacket on a nice blazer oh. you guys got nice rings you know you won a city championship and then you guys went to you went to Iowa and then you played in the pros you got not only to get a, a bachelor's you got a master's and then uh it's unbelievable the not only that, the senior ball, too. I mean, Pete and I are just going, man, this guy did everything we wanted to do. God bless him. You know, it's just – and you guys played well. I mean, I, I remember seeing the old pitchers with the Reese's All-Star jerseys on, you and Lakin and everything. And uh, and like I said, man, you when you guys – anytime you guys succeeded, we felt we succeeded. And that's the way it was because we were rooting for you guys. And – um and that's the way the Lane Tech guys have always been. I mean, obviously you got some guys who are jealous and everything, but man, we're going, man, we wanted oh, to be there. And that guy made Lewis it there. Knows. It's like we're, you know, we're telling you, but you know, there's you know a thousand other people at least out there that are like, oh man, it's because you represent, you know, the honor. And you got life. a football card made of you too. A football card. I I got your football card. I got one of those signature cards that I, I forgot what company did it. And a Panini, maybe I don't I'll, know. I'll trade you for one. I'll trade you Lake and or he could have me with a bad upside down from Sox Park when, you know, in my drinking days, I can give you that card. Um, 
But that was awesome. That, see, I was a card collector back in the day, football, baseball, hockey, whatever. And you had your own card. That was cool, too. You know, I mean, everything. Your checklist, boom, that, did this, did this, did this. And now here you are. I mean, you're accomplishing what a lot of us wanted to do and what you wanted to do. That's, that's something. He gets done with Iowa. And then, you know, I'm sure draft day, did, did you get an agent right away? You know, training for the draft, you know, the combine. Because you went to the combine. You went to Indianapolis, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I got an agent. Uh, yeah, training. how did that go? Um, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, it was either two choices, really. Like, I wanted to stay close to a connection. Like, who who knew who? It was by word of mouth. And yeah, uh, yeah there was uh, uh, Jack Becta. He, he was my agent. And he just had a lot of good rep um, as far as from the coaches and the other players. And um just decided to go with him uh he was just more he was smaller smaller agency so yeah yeah more uh more personal with the players and better cut yeah, for you. yeah trained for the uh combine and um yeah it was just go out there and just do what i put my my best show and yeah that was all right was, so you did it you banged out you know the the bench in the 40 did you like the cone drill uh, what do we got? There you are. Louis Trinket Passat, signed card right there. 90. The Senior Bowl. That's beautiful, huh? I'll trade you two hero sandwiches for that. Oh, ooh, look, I can go for a hero. You, heroes were still there when you went to Lane Tech, weren't they? They they were right on the corner, right across the street yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not there anymore, are they? Uh, well, mm -hmm. they're there, but just not there. Nobody's yeah, inside. They closed up and... Uh, the smell of the onions was the lure, you know. <laughs> That's I'm, right. trying that, 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 I'm trying to move. I'm trying to move Lewis forward here, Lewis. Oh, what was this your was back in the day? What was your favorite lunch in the lunchroom? The spicy chicken sandwich. Spicy. <laughs> How much was it? Was, uh, I I got it for free, so <laughs> nice. I was a big meatloaf guy with potatoes yeah, yeah, and corn yeah. over there. I, I, I think I like they might have had better meals with you guys by the time they got to us. Hey, I don't know if we had that that good of a meal. <laughs> Believe me. All right. It's so, only good if you're hungry. All right. We, we, we're trying to move it along. Okay. So we're, uh, the draft. So you're sitting around with your family, you know. It's one of those things. You're like waiting for the phone call. Phone call doesn't come. Oh, you know, then the religion kicks in. You say, you know what? There's a plan for me. What happened? Yeah, I was hanging out at my sister's house. I had my my just my family's my immediate siblings, yeah. family over, and yeah, I was projected to go uh, fifth round, and uh, yeah, it passes nothing. Sixth round, agents like yeah, just you know something's gonna happen, and then by the time it was over, nothing happened, and uh, yeah, I had two choices at the time. Uh, it was either Green Bay or the Rams, and. Ultimately, you couldn't go to Green Bay out of principle, right? Um, and being a, are, you, are you a Bears fan? I I never really was a sports. The only oh, okay. Chicago sports team I was the Bulls just because of Jordan, and I watched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you not? yeah, yeah. Uh, no, they actually didn't play. They played a three four, and so the best fit for me was a four three, which was the Rams played, which I played in Iowa. So mm -hmm. uh, that's ultimately why I went to the Rams. Interesting. Yeah, and um, who was the coach at the the Rams at that time? Fisher or no? Yeah, it was Coach Fish. Yeah, former was, Bear, former Bear. Yeah. Okay, Got so a, a nice guy, huh? Well, what they don't tell you, free agency. Okay, oh, I didn't get drafted, but in free agency, you get to pick where you want to go, right? So you pick your team, and uh, you you sign the contract. Do you remember how much it was for? A couple hundred, a couple hundred grand, maybe something like that. Uh well the only thing I saw from that was twenty thousand dollars signing bonus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Once you get cut, you're not because nothing's guaranteed for, for yeah. me. Yeah, okay. you're week to week, huh? Well, uh, the practice but, team you get the salary though. I thought practice squad at the at the time. Um, so it also varies. Uh, but they the minimum you ha you get is five thousand a week. Okay. Um and. That's if you remain on this practice squad because you can get cut. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, contract, 
So there's guys that um, uh, other teams may have wanted, for example. Like we had a tackle, I remember, on our practice squad that um, someone was trying to take him. They were trying to put him on their active roster. Um, and so what, what can happen is other teams can come and snag you. And But if a team really likes you, they would pay him more. Um, so, um, so for example, the minimum on an active roster squad, uh, your contract is like, I think it was like 500 something thousand. And so, uh, basically you divide that by 17 and that's what you're getting weekly. Yeah. Uh, so what would happen was there would be some guys on the practice squad that would actually get paid almost as much as being on an active roster, just so that the team could keep them. They would, there would be incentives like that. Um, but pretty much I was making, yeah, it was 5,000 uh, a week. Did they give you a per diem too for food and living expenses too, or, or are you on your own with the 5,000? You're on your own. You're on your oh, own. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of comfort ins and a lot of red roof ins, I would think, huh? Yeah. I had, uh, some friends in St. Louis that, uh, let me stay at their home. Um, once I knew I was going to be there on practice squad uh i did you mean you sign a lease but you just don't know it was yeah, yeah. i don't know if i'm gonna be here this week yeah. i can get cut tomorrow so yeah gotta go month to month for sure yeah so 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 lewis you're going through this and i'm sure you're talking to lake and like what was going on through there i'm gonna step away for two seconds and i just want to hear you go and then butch you take the next question okay sure yeah i mean um yeah, Lakin won first, so he, you know, he, he was just. I think it's different environment where where you have a team that wants you, um, right? And so he's getting reps, and the, the organization wants him, and so, um, yeah, you perform really well as a player. I mean, your confidence goes up. Um, you know, you don't got to worry about getting cut, and they they they're they're pretty much giving you opportunity to succeed. As well, a that's good, yeah. Yeah. As opposed for for me, I'm an undrafted guy, white guy, undersized. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Don't. Yeah, that's right. Not really wanted by the coaches. It was actually the GM that wanted me. Uh, who was the GM? Who was the GM at that time? Do you uh, remember? Uh, Les. Okay. Uh, he's he's still the GM for uh, the Rams right now. Uh, Les Need. Um and. Uh, Great dude. Um, I mean, a guy, but he's the he was the he was he was the one encouraging me after practice. He would come by, and I remember even when I was on a practice squad during the season, he'd be like, "Keep grinding, man. I know, I know, I know you want to play. Just, just you know, this is the situation right now. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're gonna get your shot." That's and, that's a lot better than getting that Vietnam stare from guys where they look at you, they don't want to look at you because you might get cut. That that's that, the supportive atmosphere helps you out a lot because I know when I played football. Pete played football. You played football. If you're not getting support, like you weren't from that defensive line coach, you're in, you're in stuck in the middle. You don't know how much you want to give. You know, and it's you have to feel wanted, and it, it's great that the guy made you feel wanted with the Rams. Well, Lakin yeah. didn't. Lakin didn't have it easy with the Niners, right? Did he? Was he calling you at that time? He was, was with the a, Lions. Well, Lions. Oh, Lions. First? Lions. Lions. Yeah. Yeah. He had a rough time with the Lions starting out, didn't he? Uh. For my memory, the first he was fine until the staff got fired, and then uh, when a new staff came in, he kind of went through that whole ordeal. Uh, and it's a lot of politics in the league; they'll they'll try to do anything they can to get their guys in and get you out. You know, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what they were trying to do with with him, I think, at that point, and then eventually. Uh, I don't know, was it his position coach was with the Forty ers and that's what it was, yeah. They found a trade there, and he got to be reunited with that, and he his career kind of took off from there. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, for me, it was – yeah, I had to prove myself. They were trying to do everything they can to get me out of there. <laughs> and uh, I'm the kind of guy that actually fuels me. Like, if you don't give me a chance, a fair chance, or if you think, like, I don't belong, then I'm going to show you a reason why I do belong. Yeah. So that really fueled me. And it got to the point where, like, coach wasn't even counting some of my stats. So after practice, we watch film, and they would count. They would he would go through the film, and he would mark all the stats and plays. Yeah. And he was getting to a point where he wasn't giving me credit for some some of the plays because I was making so many plays and I was beating everybody. Um, yeah. But even Aaron Donald and the starters, and so 
be, but I can't make them look bad. So he wasn't giving right. me credit for some. <laughs> That's that pursuit you had from Iowa. I'm telling you, you had good lateral pursuit. I mean, you uh, they used to call it what? What did uh, Coach Minos call it? The shit zone. You were able to get through the shit zone where it's like where the, where the offense alignment's going to crap. You were always there, two years be, uh, two yards behind the ball. You weren't getting driven back. The only time you you did is you collapsed it when guys double teamed you. I watched the games. You know, I was an offensive line guy and offensive line coach, just like Pete. And you were you were clogging up the middle. You were you were a space invader. You were taking up space. And you know it, that's so important. You know the double team, like I said earlier, is because it frees up another guy for somebody else. And you know it, that's part of the whole team atmosphere. That's why football is one of the most team concentrated games ever. Because if one guy messes up. The other guys are going down, you know, and uh, it was unbelievable. It's uh, and then I think in one game, did you get an interception or you tipped the ball to end the game? I think there was a big highlight about that. There was a game in the last couple of seconds. You you drove in. I, we'll put that up. I, I I put the video up on the Lane Tech Football Alumni site, but it was towards the end of the game in Iowa, and you came in, and I think you made a big play, and it and it it it, it forced either a punt or it forced a, a fourth uh, down non conversion. So. I mean, you were active. I mean, it's hard being what? What are you six three, six four, uh, in Atlanta? Almost six two. <laughs> okay, and, and it's hard being in the six middle when you get liar. when you got these monsters that are what six 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 seven blocking you. You know, sometimes you got to put your hand up. You know what I mean? And uh, it's just, I thought you did a great job at Iowa. And uh, I, would you start thirty two games in the last three years there? I think you maybe more than that. I say 38. thirty eight. Thirty yeah. eight. Yeah. Yeah. And. It's incredible. I mean, we had a guy on our on our team named Mark Jacobs. Is I think you might be familiar with him, Ben Jacobs. He was a linebacker at Fresno State, and then he went to Carolina and played with Cleveland. Almost a similar route with you. Now he's a coach on the Washington team, and he played starting as a freshman, but a redshirt freshman and on. So he played the most games. I think he played 54 games in four years, which is incredible. And you're playing 38 in games in three years. That's, what, 13 games a year? Unbelievable. No, I don't even know if I've been to 13 football Lewis, games outside of that. Lewis is a baller. I'm going to go back to the Rams. Quick question. How much of an animal is Donald in the weight room? <laughs> uh, yeah, he's he's another specimen. Uh, he was putting up four plates and just repping them out on a 405 recovery day or whatever. And just a typical like practice week. Yeah, 405 just. Yeah, I remember I was getting in a competition with him about we were doing planks, and I was like, I'm going to hold it longer than you. So we were just going at it, and he was just goofing around. He started hopping like he's in plank mode, and he's like hopping around in a circle just having fun. I didn't beat him, obviously, Yeah, but the man was just a uh, just an athlete. Yeah, he was – All right. But it, it, was a, it was a blessing being with him because we were – he was actually the same size. Now, I'm not equaling myself to him. He was obviously faster and stronger, but what he was able to do – I was able to copy because we had the yeah. same body type and I learned so much from him. Um, and then also the coaches gave us freedom to pretty much, yeah. if you can go behind the block and make the play, they didn't care. And I never even thought that was a lot possible because at Iowa we did, you're, you're sitting on the sideline. So yeah. I had a little more freedom to make some plays, which was nice. Leverage, leverage, leverage. So, so you're playing, man. When did, when did knee go out? When that happened? Yeah, that was in OTAs in uh, June, June uh, OTA. 7th, God 2016. Dang. Yeah, 2016, right? You're out the whole season, right? Yeah. Um, what's what's the first O? What's the O stand for? Oh, yeah, optional. Yeah, it's optional. OTA. Training activities. Oh, oh. That's what I'm saying. So it's optional. So you go to this thing. It's optional, but you have to go to it, and then you you, you tear your ACL on that thing. So you do it. Yeah. You you feel it. Like what happened? Yeah, I'm, I remember the coach was coming. Told me that that Zach day he was like, "Hey, keep doing what you're doing. You're going to back up Aaron Donald this year. Like you're going to play." And uh, yeah, I I just broke through the line and I planted, and uh, O, o line kind of just gives me a little shove in my hip, yeah, uh, and I have a pop. And I didn't know I tore it. I actually kept practicing. Um, and uh, <laughs> made a few plays after that. And then at the end of practice, I was like, it just feels kind of loose, told the trainers. And they took their MI next day. And yeah, yeah it was confirmed that it tore my ACL. Was it on one of those prescription turfs or was it on grass? It was Remember? on grass. 
Was it? Interesting. So you're going through that. It's like there's a period of time where you get the injury and you're rehabbing. And I don't know what happened next, but normally you get another injury or you can't get back to the level that you were. And you're like, oh, man, I, you know, religion or not, I, this, I can't do this anymore. What was the story? Be, like, how did that go down for you? I I came back. I came back and then the staff got fired. So now you have Sean McVay and his staff come oh, in. Oh, that's right. And then you have now a 3-4 system in. So I never played 3-4. Uh, now I have to reprove myself. Um, and they're giving me opportunities. And I'm I'm playing okay. I know I'm not playing like I normally can uh, because I'm still getting used to just the ACL in general. Um, and it's kind of like muscle it. memory. So it, it takes a little bit kind of getting back. Yeah. Plus, I was off for a while. So I'm rusty, you know. Um, ultimately... I made the team. Uh, I, I remember uh, I, I was like so shocked actually. Uh, and, and, uh, cause I was a, I didn't feel like I was playing that well, but, um, yeah. And then, uh, I remember third week of the practice game week, they called me, they, there was an injury on the team. Um, they needed a new, uh, uh, they needed another guy. So they had to cut someone cause it's, a, they can only have 53 on the roster. Mm -hmm. And they told me that they had to cut me um it was not because of my performance it was just because of numbers but they were like hey we'll sign into the practice squad we're we're still going to have you here and yeah and then about an hour later i get another call and said hey we're gonna have to let you go from the practice squad so pretty much drove from la to chicago with my stuff um i remember i was gonna take a break but my agent calls me he's like hey lions want you to come in it was like tomorrow it was like the next day it was like to, to try out do a little tryout and i was like i'm on the road i can't so i uh, ended up going they worked it out to where i when i got to chicago i flew straight to detroit there was 10 other d linemen um coach caldwell was the head coach there he's an iowa grad so i think yeah. that's kind of why i had the shot yeah he told me that i had performed the best out of the, the 10 um just stay stay ready and get, expect a call never got a call and that was it uh, i kept in touch with my agent for about a year i stayed in shape worked out and and uh just never had another opportunity and um yeah at that point that's that's when the lord was was you, you know directing my path for a yeah different yeah time. let's get to that now you are dragging across all the way across america is that what's going what the heck how did that start? How did what's his name? Cade? Your uh Wade, Wade Aaron. Wade, Wade, Wade. Yeah, okay. How did that start? Go. Uh well, pretty much after I played, you know, I hit really rock bottom, dark place in my life. Because you know, for those that don't know and they're watching this, I mean, we play football our whole lives, and that's all we do. And then our career ends, we don't have any other options. You know, we're basically starting, we're you know, you can be 25, 26 years old and you're starting off clean slate as opposed to someone that gets out of college, they're 21, 22, and they're building their career already. You know, they're already advancing. So I'm here. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I was depressed. I was like, what's the point of living? Uh, Real estate agent. Yeah. And I, I was, so I have a bachelor's and a master's at the time. I'm applying for jobs and I, all the doors are getting closed. So either I'm a terrible interview interviewee or uh, <clears throat> I just, I don't know. I, I just know that the Lord is closing those doors. And I was like, all right, let me study, get my real estate license. I can make a lot of money doing this. You know what I could have made playing football. Um, And, but every night I remember I would pray, God, give me a purpose and a plan as much as I enjoy playing football. And there was nothing for silence for two and a half years. And then finally, um, in February of 2020, I go on a mission trip to the Philippines, and that's where the Lord really changed my life. There was seven or eight other pastors on this trip that they were all had some sort of testimony that I related to, whether they were an athlete or they were going, they had went through something. And, you know, I had this legalistic mindset where I thought like pastors are super holy, you know, and perfect. And then God really showed me that he uses broken men for his kingdom. And, um, at the end of that trip, I remember God was had called me to go share the gospel, go region unreached. He delivered me from depression, from addiction uh, on that trip. Just completely, I was never the same. I was fr freed, and um, 
I said, God, I'll do anything for you. So from then I moved to Dallas uh, to attend Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, we had gotten a book called Kingdom Man by, uh, it was written by a pastor named Tony Evans. And I got this when I was with the Rams, but I never read it. So in the book, he mentions the seminary school. So when I looked that up, um, I just felt the Lord speak to me through, I'm leaving out a lot of details, but he led me there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, um, well here, how'd you find Dallas? That's a detail. Like how'd you, how'd you pick Dallas? So basically, I. Uh, you know, when I came back from the trip, my, my, the pastors were now like some of my mentors, they were like, you need to go to seminary. And, uh, they're like God. agents, not agents, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, they were just kind of, you know, wisdom. God's managers. general managers. Yeah. God's yeah general there, you managers. there you go. And, uh, I was like, I don't even know what seminary is. All right. Let me, let me, I don't know. Let me, let me see. And, yeah. uh, the, the, then I saw that Dallas Theological Seminary in the book. Um, so Pastor Tony Evans, he actually has a church in Oak Cliff in Texas. Uh, and uh, so I Google it and I know in my heart, God was telling me to study the 66 books of the Bible. And the first thing I see on the website is we teach all 66 books of the Bible. And I just felt the Lord was speaking to me through that. Pretty much sold what I had. Didn't know anybody. I said, I'm moving there. I started online May of 2020, moved after things started opening up of COVID, uh, August of 2020. And then a month later, I met my mentor, Wade, uh, and then I uh, found out what he does. And, you know, he used to be a, a substitute teacher, math teacher, and he had a red uncle encounter with the Lord. It changed his life. And he either said, God, I'm going to live like hell the rest of my life, or I'm going to go and share the gospel. And he ended up getting fired because he was sharing the gospel and they told him to stop and he didn't. And so he started his own ministry and uh I met to him. hell. Like, Those people that fired him are going to hell, Lewis. I don't <laughs> probably know. Probably live in a hell right now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Living, <laughs> if they work for CPS, they're probably living. Yeah, there. yeah. So yeah, that's how I met him and been running with him ever since. And he he the Lord told him to carry the cross to all 50 states. And uh he's actually coming out with uh, a podcast where we talk about how oh, nice started. um and uh that'll be on his website christ reward um you guys can google that yeah we'll, we'll put a link right here i so, definitely smell a smell a book coming out of this for you i mean what a what a flight you've had i mean really seriously i mean with the way you're headed it's an upward mobility right now and i mean maybe the struggle after the nfl was meant to be huh and then now you're going in an upward mobility i mean upward level right now and people might need to see that I mean, there's a lot of people struggling right now. And uh, to see someone like you, like them, and show them that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, I think that'd be a great, great uh, inspirational book for him, too. Well, the only easy day was yesterday, Butch. L Lewis, when, where did you start with the, like, how did that go? So the cross gets put together, you go somewhere, and I just see these videos. I mean, I watch you on LinkedIn, okay? And I see the videos, and you just hauling this thing. Like, where do you start? How many miles do you do a day? Where does the cross go? Where do you sleep? How heavy is it? How heavy is yeah, it? Yeah, what's good? I mean, Jesus wants to know. Well, I guess he does know. Yeah. Um, it's basically four parts. So you you can put it together. Two parts go in one ski bag. Two parts go in another ski bag. He checks them underneath a plane. We fly into a city. Um, we get to the location. We put it together, and we just walk. Um, on average, we walk nine, eight to nine miles a day. Depends. We're not. It's not about how far off fast we walk. Really, we're stopping for the one. Yeah. Uh, in the whole, we're not. We're not uh, doing anything other than planting seeds and then people are drawn to the cross they come and ask us like what are you what are you doing yeah. why are you doing this and so the whole thing is we're just pointing people to jesus that's really what we're doing um it weighs almost 70 pounds i think 65 70 pounds couldn't and you get balsa wood or something what's that balsa wood a light <laughs> a lighter wood to carry that thing yeah, it's got to be heavy. I remember being an altar boy back in the Look Catholic at his shoulders, and, man. He's still, he's still buff, man. You have to be. You have to be, no? <laughs> well, you know, Wade does more, most of the carrying. I'm just there uh, with the Lord. Oh, good. good. Uh, For the I videos. Would, yeah, just. I would work. be a follower. I would be a follower. <laughs> 
it's just kind of I'm just there to support whenever he's yeah. like, hey, do you want to carry? I'm just now, like, yeah. You know. When you guys are out and about, you, are you aggressively spreading the word or are you just doing your thing and having people walk up to you? I mean, how is that going on? Because, you know, you know how people get, you know, people, you know, are trying to get God out there and they don't want to be a, a forced into it. But he's, he's how, how, pushing what's your, on it. I've seen it, Butch. They walk yeah. up to him. People have to be ready to hear your message. You know what I mean? You can't force it on anybody, but it seems to me like they're walking up to you. Hey, what are you doing? I'm lost. And then you give like a blessing or something. Is that what happens usually? No, we just, we just walk. And, uh, a lot of times I like to trail and because you get all types of reactions, you get people blaspheming the cross, you get people yeah. spitting angry, you get people confused, you get people, oh, look, the cross. And so what I like to do is um, if typically we don't engage with people, we let them come to us when they ask and we just share uh, what we're doing. And ultimately, again, like I said, we are just pointing people to Jesus um, and we ask them, are you familiar with the message of the cross? and uh what what jesus did on the cross and we're just sharing the good news the gospel um yeah. you know, and you know we're i'm no different than they are and they're no different than me and i'm no different than anybody else in this world we're all sinners that's what the bible says and um uh, there's consequences for our sin and that's death you know that means we're separated from god and we're living our own life we're headed down the wrong path and ultimately god loves us that god he, jesus is a god of love and that he came he demonstrated on the cross for us um the consequences we deserved um he paid for them on that cross and it's simply all we need to do is receive that grace is by faith it's not by works um it's not by really it doesn't matter how many times you go to church it doesn't matter how many prayers or it's not by sacrament it's not by being a good person it's none of that it's literally having faith um and if you have faith that he died and rose again for you and you make him lord in other words i'm not living for myself anymore jesus i want to live for you then the bible says you are saved he gives you life and not only do you have a relationship reestablished with him on earth but once you pass away you're going to be in heaven guaranteed and and it is you don't have to earn it and that's what religion is religion is people trying to earn their way or or maybe a chance to 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 god but that's where jesus breaks religion and you look in the bible jesus was always against religion shattering the way religion was because he's about relationship and love and i truly believe and i know in my own life that if you were all longing for something in our hearts that's why you know whether it's football whether it's pursuing money or or sex or whatever it is we're we're trying to fill something in our hearts that only Jesus can fill because he created us yeah. and we all desire to live forever but it's only with him um and sin messed everything up and so it's the the problem is we have to realize that we need we need he can fill it and we need him and so that's the message that's the truth and yeah. we, I share that with people I share it because I live it. I know, and I've been through it. And and um, and yeah. So you get all types of people that are drawn, and I. That's the message we share. It's really of love. We're not arguing with people. There's times, there's people that are not ready to receive this message yeah. yet, and their time will come. And there's some people that, I mean, we had a girl in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, walk up to us crying because she was like praying for a sign and she was like this is from i i know i need to get back to god this is him he's he's calling me and she just gave her life to jesus right there and uh it's just important to remember that it's not religion and that anybody can have a relationship with jesus it's just they got to be willing to say you know what i'm done living for myself god i want to i want you I, I want a relationship with you and you give him control man i'm it's there's freedom mm -hmm. uh that's the way I describe it. A lot of us are in bondage and we're in a prison cell and there's a key on the ground and we're trying to get out of this cell yeah, and we're, yeah, like, yeah. Thin, we're staying in there, but really the key is Jesus. And all we have to do is pick him up, unlock that door and he sets us free. And um, that's the message. That's what we're trying to tell people. Um, and, Lewis, yeah. we're, we're, we're at the end of the show here and I'm going to ask a smart ass question. You can choose to answer or not. If it's ask Wade this uh, for me, just a guy from, you know, nor Northwest side of Chicago, if it's all God's plan, why did he put me on the wrong path? I would say um, that he doesn't, he didn't put you on the wrong path. He gives us a choice um, and sin corrupts 
um, our 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 point of view, I would say. Um, and so what we think we think uh, sin is good, like what we think makes us feel good, we go pursue that. But in reality, all he's doing is leaving us empty. Um, and he's given us a choice. And ultimately, we know what that choice is. We can say, you know what, I see this isn't going to fill me. It's not doing me any good. Um, and it's just surrendering. It's realizing that I can't do this on my own. Um, and it's going to Jesus. And he's there welcoming you with open arms. He's really, he wants to heal the hurt in our hearts. He wants to guide. He wants to give us, he wants to direct us on the right path. Um, the Bible says he is the light for our next step and he is the light for our path. And uh, we're blinded when we push him away. There's darkness. And then we're walking. We don't know where we're walking anymore. And so he's that light. He's that love. And he he has those things. Now, is life perfect for me? Is there ups and downs? No. And and um, But I am at peace because I know I have him and I know where I'm going when this life is over. And um so I don't know if that really answers the question. Ah, but... well, here, Butch, St. Hedgewick graduate. Uh, any final questions on God's plan for uh, Louis trinkett Passat? I think he set him in the right direction of that he wants to be in and that he believes he can help the people the most where he's at right now. And believe me, when you played at Iowa, when you guys were at Lane Tech, went in the city championship, you were helping other people. Because people were more uh, focused on Lane Tech football, Iowa, guys from Lane watching you. They were watching your path. All Don't kid yourself. Everyone's been watching your path. And then people have been asking, well, what happened? Well, now we know. And we could, you know, uh, we could put it out there, let people know where you're going right now. Me, myself, if you talk to God later, ask him for a uh, do-over for Butch Bresky. I live on the northwest side by Hiawatha Park. And let's see what we can, we can barter with him on that, huh? But I think, Louie, you're, you're in the right spot. I mean, you had you had some tremendous coaches with you. You had some good players with you. You've had some good support systems. You've got a good foundation at home. Uh, now you're growing up. How old are you right now? 28, 30? How old are you right now? 31. I'll be 31. 31. 31. 31. You're old, oh, dude. Man, that's I just left the bar business at that time, man. And uh, and uh, that, that, I was looking for a way out. Believe me. And uh, I blew out my knee at a bachelor party, so I got my way out of that. So see how things work like that? Uh, it's just been so nice talking with you. We've been wondering, who is this guy, the Lane Tech guy who made it, that we're so yeah. jealous of and we're so supportive of throughout your career? And that's that's the that's the honest, the God's truth. Because everybody and, – and, and if you looked on that Lane Tech Facebook page, I was giving you guys, you and Lakin, some love on there. Anytime I could find something, I was putting it on there. I wanted Anytime people to know Butch about you. Finds it. love that you must have been good, Lewis. Lewis, how can we uh, point our, our listeners and viewers towards your message? What, where should we send them to? Um, yeah, I mean, one option right now is uh, if if I am kind of interning with wade so um, i i kind of ended in june but i'll still be running with him so christ reward there's kind of you'll see the videos of what we're doing there yeah yeah okay. on social media um i'm on instagram um facebook all right, all right we'll send it and we'll put instagram right here for you uh is there anything else you wanted to put out there you feel good i'm just grateful man i'm grateful for you all giving me an opportunity um let's I know do you this get... again with wade yeah, let's do it. I'll let him know. You can you can have him hop on, and uh, he can probably share some more. And ultimately, whenever I get a platform now to share, I just want to point people to yeah. Jesus. That's where that's where it is. And so I I think I I you know y'all gave me the opportunity today. I'm grateful. Um, last thing I'll share too is I just started doing this. Um, as far as you know, I'm full time, and I used what I had on my own. And you know if. God speaks to people's hearts. They see this and they're like, Hey, we want to, we want to be a part of his team. Um, yeah. financially, you know, um, I do, I do need monthly, uh, partners. Ideally, that's what I look for. Um, I do have Patreon a Patreon or where PayPal, like where, where do we send people send you some cash? Um, I do have a link, um, where I'm like partnered with modern day mission and okay. You can even scan yeah, that. But yeah. They're perfect. Okay, good. And, uh, if they scan that, or uh it's if if uh yeah if they if they want to connect with me ideally they just they can reach out to me on social media and say hey we we heard about partnering with you financially 
what I like to do is I like to meet with them one on one. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, just reach out on social media. That'll be the best way. Um, I my number is on there uh, on the on the card and email as well. So, what's the number? It's uh, 872-223-0538. All right, we just you probably spread the word to probably thirty four people. Louis Trinka Passat. Walter Butch Bresky, thank you for coming on Chicago back in the day. What a hell of a show. Thanks, Very guys. Good. Great show, Lewis. Great, man. All right. of Jesus is just fully committed to, to following God at all costs. He's interning with me right now, but I would say sometimes I'm learning from him uh, because of his passion to, to share the gospel with people, to share the message of Christ. And so he's more than just an intern. Um, he's someone I am encouraged with and learning from as well. And he's an encouragement to, to me and many others. What's happening? What, why do you feel so emotional? I don't know, I just am. I think, uh, I think it's just amazing how the Lord brings everything full circle in a sense to show one old life and old past and then living for Him, there's nothing better. I was in that stadium and 70,000 people were cheering for me and whatever, sometimes chanting my name, but it's not about that and just talking to this one guy right here and even walking with this lady i just there's nothing that's more fulfilling uh, that's where we park well thank you yeah what can I say? yeah so i have a question real quick we'll walk again yeah um so what does what does the message of the cross mean to you god i don't want to cry <laughs> but um I kind of strayed away from the church because um, there was bad experience with my pastor was questionable. Yeah, ever since then I just haven't been willing to kind of open up about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard that men would, that you know, they're representing God. And yeah, and then to see him do something like that, it kind of just destroyed my trust in the church and everything. Yeah, that's, that's just really hard. There's a lot of pain there. Yeah. And, um, yeah, your name's Heidi, right? Yeah. All right, can I put my hand on your shoulder? Yeah. All right. Jesus, I just pray for Heidi, and I just pray that you comfort her, and we thank you for this encounter with her. And Holy Spirit, we just pray for, for healing in her heart. And uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you say during all that time, at some point, there was, was there ever a time where you like gave Jesus your life, you surrendered? I don't think I've had an experience like that yet. Yeah. And I think I'm waiting for it. What if today's the day? I guess it is, I'm crying, so. Yeah. You know, I do us again. Yeah, that's weird. No, that's literally so weird. I, I was taking a video and I was like, oh my God, I see them again. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence. No, like, it's really weird. Like, this is so weird and I haven't cried in so long. It's crazy. You guys are making me rethink my life right now. The beautiful thing is, it's not about getting it all right today. It's just Jesus, yeah. all he's doing is he's opening the door and he's inviting you into his home, into heaven. and. When you enter a relationship with someone, you figure it out as you get to know them more and more. And all just taking a step of that, it's that first leap of faith, that first step of faith, saying, you know what, I'm done living for myself. Jesus, I'll do, I'll, I, want, I want to live for you. I'll give you control of my life. And it's freeing. The, the, the Bible says where, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Meaning, He's going to free you from your bondages and you get to walk in peace. You get to just enjoy their lives. He wants you to enjoy the things, but it's doing you with Him and the, he's the source and we're missing the source at times and uh 
he wants to be your source. He wants to be your source today. He's, he's pursuing you and you feel what you feel right now because the Holy Spirit is touching your heart. Yeah, it's creepy. It's freaking creepy. Well, it's, it's the Lord. He's, well, like, he's, what do I do now? It's like, just, it's, the Bible says you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You say, Jesus, I give you my life. And I believe if you do that from your heart, he'll, he'll meet you here. And it's, and that's what you want. Just say that right now. Jesus. Jesus is I, life. I give you my life. I give you my life. And just trust him. <laughs> It's not living for me, it's living for Jesus. And it's just, I don't really know how to put it into words. It's just, it's, he wants to use me and he's showing me how he's using me and he's just, yeah, I'm just emotional. <laughs> Holy Spirit, we just pray that you feel Heidi right now with your spirit. I pray today that she sees this as a new beginning. The Bible says if you put your faith in Jesus, and you believe, if you believe in your heart, it says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, in other words, for me, it was football. That was my life. That was my identity. But when I lost that, I was depressed. I didn't know what to do. And I encountered the love of Jesus. And when I encountered that love, he said, Lewis, I don't care about what you did. He said, I love you. Jesus doesn't require you to do anything. I want to just give him your heart. Have faith. And he guarantees life. Here you are now, a veteran, a leader. Uh, the unit is, appears for my level to be pretty strong. What's that been like just to see that turn around in your career? Does that mean? There's no words really to explain it. It's just kind of like a roller coaster ride. I mean, everybody has their ups and downs. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a learning process every day. Uh, just as a, as a person on and off the field, uh, it's maturing.